Yo, 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 what's going on guys? It's your boy Player X here with the Semi Limited Podcast. As usual, I just want to appreciate everyone for coming in this episode, for tuning in, for sharing, for vibing out, whatever they're doing with the podcast. Hey, that's your business, not mine, you know? So be sure to uh, check out what we got going on uh, next week. Uh, a lot of the uh, sneak peeks are going to be happening, so we're going to see what we can get from our local sponsorship to give back to you guys, the fellow listeners. I appreciate the being the top podcast for 40 of plus of you guys, so can't thank you guys enough for having a great year last year, and like I said, we're more on to bigger and better things this year, and I can't wait to bring you guys the, better, the biggest and best uh, podcast that the TCG has ever seen. Before we get into today's episode, which is going to be a recap of the remote uh, YCS that happened over the weekend, some of the things going on with Phantom um, uh, Nightmare, and you know a couple things going on in the meta as well, I'd like to get out all of the sponsorships and tags uh, beforehand. So as usual, be sure to go to our link tree down below and click on that uh, l little uh, box right down there. It's going to bring up a tab with all of our social sites. You'll be able to go on there and click all the social sites and follow us, subscribe, uh, hit the notification bell, all those things. Be sure to get in contact with us as much as you can because we do con uh, communicate with you guys and let you guys know when we're doing giveaways. Speaking of giveaways, uh, we did seven giveaways last year and I can't wait to double that. I'm gonna do at least 14, maybe 15 we can squeeze in for uh, this year. But that requires you guys to do a lot of the legwork as far as sh uh, sharing and promoting, which means that we'll do another giveaway when we hit 50 Instagram, uh, sorry, 50 TikTok followers, 100, uh, Twitter followers, 200 Instagram followers, and 200 YouTube followers. I think I'm going to throw on 100 for the Discord for whatever uh, next prize we have, just because I want to make sure the Discord is getting some love there. We're actually almost at 100. I think we're almost like 92, something like that. So be sure to click on it and get into those sites. Speaking of being plugged in, shout outs to Unplugged Gaming out in Manlius, New York for sponsoring the podcast. You can join their Discord server, speaking of Discord, in the description box below to be in that little link down there. You can be a part of all their TCG communities that they have there. They have Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic, uh, Pokemon, Lorcana, uh, Digimon, One Piece, whatever your heart desires, they got it down there. You can go chit chat with someone, maybe get some uh, game knowledge in, maybe set up a trade. And when you show up in store, be sure to tell them that the boys over at Semi Limited sent you because the staff over there at Unplug Gaming and Joe are all fantastic people and always uh, so greeting and nice. So be sure to shout out the Semi Limited podcast and I'll be sure to hook you guys up. And lastly, before we get into the episode, as usual, be sure to catch Brad, aka Perfect, Mr. Perfect, doing his live stream on Twitch every Saturday at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For those who are outside of the U.S., it's going to be 11 p.m. on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, his Twitch will be in the link tree below as well, so you can click on there. It'll be like uh, Perfect Gaming or I think Perfect Streaming or whatever we had it uh, listed as there. So you click on that. Be sure to catch his streams. He'll be out there doing deck theories, playtesting before bigger events like OTS Championships or Regionals, maybe even the next YCS that we all decide to go to. You can catch him on stream, training for it. I pop in and out every once in a while, so it's a good way to interact with us. And anything that you guys do on stream will wind it up in the Friday night wrap-up. So be sure to be as interactive as possible and catch brad doing that uh without any further ado i want to be able to uh finally introduce our guest who's been waiting very very patiently for me to spit all that nonsense at you guys uh and we'll be joined today by none other than i wanted to make sure that i got someone really good for you guys i went out to the regional at the cat scales in uh, new york uh, over the last couple weeks and i ran into this duelist and I've heard very, very nice things, very high praise from fellow duelists such as uh, Chris LeBlanc and even Paulie Aronson, our world champ, you know. So uh, they've mentioned this guy by name and said he's a great guy. We should have him on. I ran into him at the regional. And just like they said, he was a very, very down-to-earth guy. Loved having a conversation with him. He was a very, very smooth-talking guy, uh, really easy to talk to and uh, approach. So without any further ado, I want you guys to make as much noise as you can from whatever place you were in in space and time for my man Hani Jawari of High Frequency Games. What's going How's on? How's it going, everybody? Yep. How's it going? I'm excited to be on here. You know, I haven't done anything like podcast or uh, YouTube related in uh, over a year now. So, I mean, yeah, it's huge to finally. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, it's huge to actually be on. Uh, just been busy. Yeah. Been busy. You know, you know, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I did a couple things, you know, last year, but, uh, uh, nothing for like YouTube other than like maybe like a duck profile or two. So, 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I subscribe to you on YouTube, and I see a couple of them too. Just because you you always want to see what the great minds are thinking of, or what they're labbing up, what they're able to, what crumbs they're able to give to the public. Because I know a lot of the playtest circles, especially when you get the higher up, the you know, the higher tiered ones, they all are very very secretive and like very very, uh, I would say, closed off about what they leak out into the general public because they, obviously they want to hold the edge, and that's the only way to, to keep that competitive you know balance. But you know. I still do admire the people who come down and, and spend time with uh, us and, and sh share their, their stories and times and whatnot. So I appreciate you coming down and joining us today, honey. Uh, is there any shout outs or any sponsors that you want to uh, shout out to the guests or any of the, anyone listening uh, before we get started? Uh, like you said before, uh, shout out to High Frequency Game. Uh, that's my team. Uh, so uh, shout out to them, Michael Saniba. You know, uh, that's pretty uh, much it. Or, uh, I think shout out. I guess like the last one I'll actually put out is uh, you guys can go check out uh, my coaching service on uh, learntcg.com. Uh, that's where I do all my coaching. Uh, I do private sessions and I also run a classroom, um, which is a monthly classroom where you get access to my Discord, where pretty much I test in all the time. Like I pretty much commit all my hours into that Discord and uh, just testing with my students and uh getting ready for events so um, if you guys want to check yeah. that out it's uh learnccg.com yeah it sounds like the best way honestly to uh to do that too gets uh, the hand the one-on-one -on -one hands-on type of approach which i actually genuinely like because i'm more of a hands-on kind of guy I, I, you can watch youtube videos all day but if they don't explain what's going on or how to do something better or why you misplayed you know the, this, what's the point of watching it you're not really improving you're just realizing your faults without any way of solving them so you know respect to that anyone who uh, is listening we've uh, definitely gone back and forth on the the coaching situation i might bring that up a little bit later just because we have an actual yeah. higher tiered coach in the uh our presence today yeah that uh that that gets brought up a lot uh is is coaching worth it or do i think it's uh like worth the value and at the end of the day um i try to make it uh as most valuable as possible as like i do as much as i possibly can first of all i i leak everything like at the end of the day i don't i don't withhold any type of information my information is your information uh once we get into a session or once we get into the classroom i'm usually just giving out my information most of the time um mm -hmm. we go over deck theories we go over uh side patterns we play matches constantly play matches because this is like the way to up your technical play like the best way to do that is uh playing mass matches like playing like 30 matches in a row is something that will like help you increase your technical play you'll learn your deck a lot more if you just like grind consistently uh against your friends or against your testing group usually uh, i try to duel against my students um we're all that testing in the same discord uh currently i have currently about seven people in there as well as chris leblanc i have my brother also in there for the month because uh, he's going to be my partner for the 3v3 so i just wanted to mm -hmm. expand and have multiple like minds in one singular discord and we you know we're all prepping for vegas some are prepping for regionals but mostly are just prepping for vegas and even though that we're all on different teams we still like share information that's uh that's just what we do we're we're kind of like i said we're, mm -hmm. we're we're pretty we're pretty chill on that um also like for us to give more value uh the the monthly class like is the best way to do that because in a, in a singular session okay it's it's a 50 dollars an hour type deal and the reason is because it's an hour of our time and it's not something that like it's not like a commitment you know like it, it's it's only an hour where in the classroom it's two hundred dollars for the month but you're you're in the discord with us like frequently like the full 30 yeah, the, days the value you know? is is you know yeah wednesday we run a classroom we run a classroom from uh seven to eleven but usually the main value out the classroom is honestly outside the Wednesdays in my personal opinion because we're just inside the court testing playing you could hop in the court you can ask a question you could ask to duel I'm willing to test it's like a testing circle that 
a lot of people don't have and I'm trying to offer that. And like, there's not many people mm -hmm. in the game that of offer a coaching ser service and that's like, and that's actually trying to help at the end of the day. You know, I've been doing this for like a year now and I've been, I've been constantly pushing, like pushing it, trying to make it like the best place to learn Yu-Gi-Oh at the end of the day. Cause I feel like a lot of, a lot of other coaching services, like I was on Metafy and I was just doing Metafy sessions for like, I think it was 50 an hour. I could, I think it's up to 75 now because they do fees and, and all that, etc. cetera. But uh, I was doing that for a minute and I just realized that like, I would rather have like a classroom setting where I can help multiple people. Uh, yeah, it's different than a Zoom yeah. call, you know? Yeah, so I, I actually reached out to Metify in, in order for them to create a, a classroom uh, type setting. And um, they couldn't for like a year and a half. So I created a site with my friend, Pat Tobin, um, in order to do that. And uh, yeah, Metify, I think, just got to the point of creating the classroom setting. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, like, uh, you know, it, it just took too long for them to push it out. So I already had created a site, but I am still with Metify. I still do coaching on Metify. I do still support the, the, the site. I think it's a great site. Uh, it's the reason why, like, mm -hmm. I'm like, like still doing coaching till this day, you know, like it was one of like the main reasons why I started in the beginning. Cause I felt like, you know, a lot of people do want to learn how to play Yu-Gi-Oh! And I've been spreading my knowledge for a while now, you know, with, uh, within the game like i had helped previous players win like cody angeloff yeah. uh, gabriel vargas toby short you mm -hmm. know i have a have a lot of friends that i've helped get to the top and um, at the end of the day i wanted to spread my knowledge within uh, a wider community you know like i didn't want to just you know spread it with between you know just my friends i wanted to give other people access at the end of the day and um yeah, honestly, it's been great. I have Chris LeBlanc working on the site with me. And at the end of the day, he's also committed. Uh, I've never seen someone else so committed to, to coaching, helping other people succeed. Um, and I feel like that's something that you kind of want from a coach, somebody that's going to want to see you win and actually like help you on their free time and not care about the hours at the end of the day. Because like, yeah, at the end of the day, we'll we'll do an hour session and it's never an hour you know it's always going to be over the top like we really just want to make sure that when you leave the session that you you've learned something you you got you've came there and you got what you were looking for at the end of the day like because like at the end of the day when you go into a coaching session people are looking for different things people are trying to look for all right is my deck list proper or they're looking for all right how do i side deck properly or they're looking for mm -hmm. how that's a big one how yeah. to how to like best play out their lines like how to best play out their hands there's so many different types of ways to like cover coaching and 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 sometimes an hour isn't enough you know in order to cover everything usually like it starts off with just the deck building type ordeal where i go over your deck we go over side patterns but then as things go on you know, uh, I start showing off combos, then people are more interested to keep doing more and like start start going into the technical side of things, yeah. you know. Um, it's almost like uh, like uh, any kind of martial arts that people take. Of course, you're you're learning from someone who's better and you're going at a session. You, you don't obviously learn everything in one session. You go once a week or twice a week or however often you go. Uh, per week and then you see each other's progression and you see like what's their uh, natural skill what the, what's their fault you can see all right cool like you said maybe side decking isn't your thing maybe you should start picking these non-engine cards to start siding out maybe not side out this engine uh these cards should be going in don't side in more than nine you know what i'm saying you should be asking your opponent what deck or what their card count is when you sit down and like all these little things that you can do just to you know get you from I would say a entry level player to one of the more competitive players are all things you can learn from having someone such as yourself. And like, as you said, other notable players like Patrick Hoban, who's uh, probably notably one of the most influential Yu-Gi-Oh players of all time. Uh, and then, you know, LeBlanc. five time 
winner Gorilla Bonk, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yep. You know, all those minds together working in for the same thing. Like that's a, a lot of uh, experience you got in. Uh, I, I think I heard one time some people made the comparison that uh, there was a, a plumber who comes, who gets called for this house and this house is leaking everywhere. There's a faucet that just won't stop running or whatever like that. Uh, the, the guy asked what was wrong. The, the guy said, I have one through three other plumbers. They can't find anything. Uh, I just want this leak done and I'm going to clean up everything. He goes, all right, cool. It's going to cost you 1500 and I can fix it right now. He goes, all right, cool. No problem. He sent the money over. The plumber takes two looks at the leak, grabs a wrench and hits the wrench against the pipe one time and the leak stops. And he goes, all right, your, your, your leak is done. Have a good day. And he goes, I just paid you $1,500 for that for five seconds of your time. He goes, no, you pay me $1,500 to know that for 20 years, I've been experiencing pipes and know that this is just the burst one and I, I know how to fix it in the fastest way possible. Uh, but what, what you don't know is the 20 years that I put behind there and, you know, fixing that every single pipe until I got to, you know, this point right here. And that's what most people don't uh, take a look at is the road behind it. They'll probably look at something like, oh, I'm not spending $50 to, you know, get a coach or to have someone do something that I can go do for free. But it's like, you're not paying for i guess the coaching you're paying for the experience of having someone help you find the better part of your like your game like they can look at it from an objective outside perspective and be like all right this is what you're good at this is what you're bad at you're naturally good at this maybe deck building is what some people are really good at but their technical play sucks uh maybe they misplay a lot maybe they don't know how, they're misplaying because their uh their deck list is wrong and that's what the you know point of all that shit is so yeah no i i definitely encourage people having coaches in, in all standpoints of their life whether it be uh a gym coach uh, a health coach fitness coach whatever you know what i'm saying a, a therapist or a mental coach whatever you got going on you you need someone who knows the game who's going to be able to point you in the right direction i don't think everyone should be doing everything themselves all the time I yeah it's a it's a, it's a real bit, commitment uh, i think i agree yeah. with you like at the end of the day it's a, it's a commitment hard because i'm making sure that i'm knowledgeable in the format every single month and adjusting with the format and trying to keep up find the best strategy for not only me but like several other people and it's hard sometimes you know like i'm not only looking to to help myself and like i'm not only looking for my own success but i'm looking for success for everybody around me at the end of the day so i'm putting in mad hours uh into the format trying to understand every single thing uh for example phantom nightmare which releases in like two weeks from now i've been play testing since uh since the second week of december right after ycs uh bologna i got back yeah. and i started testing phantom nightmare immediately testing the fire king deck testing the snake eyes deck testing other decks outside of those like rescue ace silent force labyrinth those are the main decks mm. that are going to be around going into the next format and i'm trying to make sure that everyone in my discord has an understanding of all these decks because when you show up to the event you kind of need to be prepared for all those top decks at the end of the day and you got to understand get with the times and try to adjust and make sure that you're knowledgeable about what's around. And ideally, I think those are the five main matchups that you should worry about. There are other decks in the game, of course, that are gonna that are gonna pop up because like people will still play decks even though, you know, they're not the best. At the end of the day, not everyone's gonna spend two thousand dollars on this deck yeah this about to say a deck. card note yeah, right? spend a house mortgage and shit yeah, yeah but they will but they will play a deck that they enjoy over it or they will play what they think is the next best option personally i think mm -hmm. the next best option for those decks are the labyrinth deck and the silent force deck those are the two best other options outside of the decks that are currently being played like the the fire king deck the rescue ace deck and the snake eye pure yeah so yeah uh, I, I think that there's other other decks that are around that are not going to be played as much like centurion uh dragon link etc those decks will pop around and you will verse them and the biggest thing is knowing those decks it's it sucks when you don't have the knowledge against those types of decks like decks that you're not too familiar of there's so many decks in the game you -Oh, you'll versus a deck that you don't know and you could lose to it at an event at the end of the day just by not knowing what the cards do and the 
best way to fix that issue is actually to play in the rated system of dueling book. And I know this sounds crazy, but like at the end of the day, like when people complain about, oh, the early, the early side of ranked is just terrible. It just isn't because you're getting, you the, grind it up, you're getting that, that like feel for those other decks that you might verse in the tournament that could catch you off guard. Um, and just having like the knowledge on every deck I think is super important because you just never want to be in a position where you're reading somebody's cards at an event, it's cutting time off the clock, or you lost because you didn't interact in the correct scenario. Uh, the bright side is going into the next format is the Fire King deck is so overwhelming. It usually just could play through majority of the other rogue decks like boards or like even just or even just like crack their fields very easily. There's not many decks that could really compete, like I said. Uh, Silent Force is a is a great deck. I think that people should keep their eye on. I think it's probably one of the better uh, rogue options uh, for the format. Um, it, it just it just it does a lot. I feel like for uh, for like one card combos, they have a few one card combos. Uh, they can play cards like Extravagance. Uh, they can play multiple hand traps. Uh, they could side cards like Summon Limit. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of big benefits oh, yeah, within absolutely. that deck. So I think like that's like a deck that people should really keep an eye out. Um, Labyrinth. What can I say about Labyrinth? It, it doesn't really it doesn't really change much from where it's at now. And like that's the thing with the Labyrinth deck. At the end of the day, like the Labyrinth deck, it, it's just it's just not going to get. Yeah, once like, transaction came out, it, it's like that's the only new that's card it. that's going to be played. You know, it's, yeah, that's you, it. You guys you know? already know the. the Style, yeah yeah like you, transactions out and you know it's not going to get any better than what it is right now so i mean the deck is still good and do i think that the pure variant of labyrinth is good i think i think it's not as strong as the unchained version at the end of the day and like mm. based off results recently in the last like week uh i think that we can see that the pure the pure version of labyrinth didn't perform as well as the unchained version of the Labyrinth deck. Uh, I think Arnold Nadabon got top four at the at the YCS this weekend, and uh, Christian Urena also got uh, sixth place at the Philly Regional with the uh, with the Labyrinth deck with the unchained cards in the deck. And at the end of the day, that portion of your deck raises the ceiling a lot of the time because just being able to make a Yama on your turn, which turns into like a whole unchained combo, is actually mad pressure through interactions like sometimes like your opponent will throw interactions at you like uh like getting ash blossomed on your trap card like you started off ariana you got you, you got to the you got to the clock you you use the clock you you use the stovey you put the clock back on the board you go to flip your trap and they ash your belly you well now instead of passing turn like the pure labyrinth deck would do right you make yama and now you're just like doing a whole different combo and extending and like that's why i think the labyrinth like the labyrinth unchained version is yeah, way better than, is definitely yeah there. yeah so like at the end of the day like that is like the deck that i think is is like probably better to play than like the pure labyrinth deck yeah, and i think those scary. those are the decks that i feel like are going to be like mainly focused on for uh phantom nightmare the the fire king decks and the and the snake eye deck and the rescue ace deck i can go on for hours about those decks uh, but at the end of the day, like, uh, that's something I feel like people have to really get into and start testing. I know a lot of people have been really focused on the format uh, at hand right now. And I don't know if that's necessarily a great thing. I feel like if you were uh, really wanting to be serious about, like, the next few upcoming events, I know a lot of people might not even be attending the next few events because their uh, majority are 3v3s. Yeah. But uh, if you are playing, attending those events, you should have really been focusing on Phantom Nightmare because that that set changes the game drastically. Drastic. And then, yep. because like you're you're absolutely right. So just out of curiosity, because I think you touched upon it a little bit, I think you were at least brushed up on it. So like, does your training regimen for competitions ever like change or vary, or is it like so like t like take us through like. 
let's just say you, you said um, at the end of uh, the last YCS, you said you went to Balagna. And then you said at the end of that, now you're in Phantom Nightmare. But do you, like, are there any YCSs that you're looking to go to? Are there any regionals? I know you went to the Catskills regional, but are there any ones on there that you're uh, looking to like take down that you're uh, like trying to win or just kind of using these regionals as like play testing circles and like trying to put the theory like, you know, to the test? Yeah, so I attended a few regionals uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, I was really just tr trying to trade uh, at the event. Um, nothing, nothing crazy. I, I went and played Philly the, on the last week. I actually decided, you know what, I'm just going to play this one. And um, I, I ended up signing up with Fire King last minute. I didn't do so great because at the end of the day, I haven't been playing uh the current format i've mainly been focusing on phantom nightmare right, right. as well as all my students like it's all my students none of them yeah none of them are actually gonna like are actually playing the current format they're more all focused on phantom nightmare because they're all attending mm -hmm. either costa rica or ycs vegas and they're trying to get ahead of the game so um i think like my main focus has just been on phantom nightmare and for up upcoming tournaments uh that i'm looking to go to and attend uh, where I'm just a trying to prep for Vegas and Costa Rica. Those are the two main ones that are upcoming in a few weeks. Um, I, I have Australia that I'm booked for, but that's all the way in March. Uh, anything can happen by then, a band list or anything, you know? So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. March is a little bit but, ahead of time. Anytime after three months, I get weary. Yeah, 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 100%. But yeah, I'm just prepping for those events mainly. And like in order to prep for those events, it's – it's just a lot of commitment and a lot of time. Like you have to look into so many different things. Phantom Nightmare has so many good cards that it brings a could, lot to the table. Yeah, it brings a lot to the table. And like in taking all that information in two weeks, it's almost impossible in my opinion. Because like at the end of the day, there's so many, there's so many things that come out in Phantom Nightmare. It's just not. It's not just the Fire King stuff. It's not just the Snake Eyes stuff, you know? Like, they have, yeah, uh, Raid they have a lot of... Raid Raptors get support. Raid Raptors get support. support. Yep. yep, exactly. There's a whole there's, bunch of other decks getting support as well. Yep, Raid Raptor is a is a great deck. Uh, I did not mention that as uh, one of my... As one of the top ones. Um, mainly because I think it has a harder time going second. But that deck is almost like an auto win when it goes first. Like, usually... That deck just auto wins going first in, in all seriousness. Yeah, it's, yeah it's with the lot, towers. It's a lot yeah, to yeah it, it has a tower. Yeah, they got they a end, new towers now. Yeah, they end on a new towers. They end on a trap card that is a hot red. Um, and uh, the, the, the towers also blows up your board. And they end on two of those. They end on one straight up, and then they summon another one on, their, on, on your turn. And it blows up your board, and then they have the hot red negate so i mean that's uh that's a pretty good board and they also draw one card within that combo oh, that's not that bad it's always like a good to have diversify uh combo lines you know what i'm saying being able to draw uh pop boards on your opponent's turn when they're trying to build you know all definitely things that you want you know in some sort of yeah it has a lot of follow-up too though. like like yeah like the 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 spell recycles to draw you a card and it also puts the trap on the field and um the, the the trap card the, the hot red trap has an effect in the grave where you could banish it and then it adds back a uh, raid raptor from the banished or the graveyard so that's that's also huge oh, know, so, okay so the, that deck actually has like a lot of good like like good recursion past uh its turn one board uh the, the main issue i would say is just going second with that deck but other than that that deck is just amazing right now yeah going first is definitely a threat for sure would you say that your training regimen changed between uh, like events? Like, or do you like is your training the same? Are your students on the same training regimen? Like uh, x amount of time per day or x amount of duels per day? Uh, any like time frame that you feel as though like the best time to get optimal like I guess so, opponents or anything like that? Yada yada. So I'm available at all times of the day, pretty much. I I don't <laughs> work currently. I'm just I don't sleep. So I just pretty much just do coaching sessions and uh i'm currently uh doing like claim sales and i'm about to start uh an llc with my brother uh and we're about to mm -hmm. start moving cards um as uh jahari bros so we're, we're gonna 
start okay. doing that hey soon. congratulations man That's yeah 100 i appreciate it uh so I, so usually i have a lot of free time because like it doesn't really like i don't doesn't take much time out of my day by uh like moving cards and um you know other than that like i'm fully committed to the coaching and like that's something different you know there's not a lot of like i'm personally like committing like my whole entire you know like yeah, all my time yeah. this is what i do you know i'm playing Yu Gi Oh frequently constantly you know like i, I play Yu Gi Oh every day i played Yu Gi Oh this morning before i got into this call i was playing Yu Gi Oh. you know <laughs> yeah absolutely and, and then he got into this call for the people who are listening and then i was already play testing some other shit as soon as he did as soon as he jumped in the call i was live streaming he just jumped right in and started like watching the duel just sitting there like paying attention you know taking note like i i think it very much shows that you're very attentive to what's going on in the format. Yeah, like I'm just trying to be like consistent and active and just making sure that I'm ahead of the game because at the end of the day, like I said, it, it's not just for me at the end of the day. I'm not looking after just myself at this point. I'm looking after like pretty much everyone that's just that's committed into the Discord because they're as just committed as I am if they're willing to pay for the session, yeah. you know, and at Absolutely. the end of the day, I'm trying to make my Discord one unit. You know, I'm trying to have my Discord active all hours through the day, and we're all testing for a bigger goal. You know, I I mm -hmm. believe I manifest. You know, I believe that you put your mind to something, you can accomplish it, and that goes for anybody. You know what I'm saying? Correct. Correct. Like I it's agree. just it's it's just about manifesting, commitment, and time at the end of the day, and look everyone has bad you know bad runs everyone has bad years you can't have that affect your mentality towards the game or towards what you're trying to accomplish like last year 2023 i didn't do so great at, at events you know i went probably four four tops out of 16 events like that is like you know that is crazy and i know it's 16 events sounds wild like has there really been 16 events? Yes, there was 16 events, right? And I've only topped four of them, which isn't great. You know, and some people would be like, damn, dude, you top four events. That's, that's great. You know, some people would look at it differently, you know, but at the end of the day, like we're all going to have, you know, tough times. It's not always controllable. You know, you can only do so much. It's about what you do after, you know, it's about, it's about putting in the time and, committing after you don't do well you know like you didn't do well and you're like you know what i'm, I'm gonna get better like, i don't i don't care i'm gonna you do know, whatever yeah. it takes. why why didn't i do well what, yeah why what can i, I do... change what can i do differently exactly yes i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna evolve i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna try harder i'm gonna do i'm gonna go out the way i'm gonna do more than i did last time and you know that's you know that's what it that's what it takes to get to where you want it you know like i've i've been in a position where I've won before multiple times, you know, and I'm trying to, and I'm trying to obviously accomplish more into the game, trying to, I'm trying to accomplish like a lot of things. I'm trying to go to world. I'm also trying to win world. Like it's a big, it's a, it's a big thing to just want to go to world. I want to win yeah. world. There's something it's, you know, it's, it's, it's that, it's that type of mentality that you want to have. And like at the end of the day, do I think I'm capable of hundred percent? I know I'm yeah. capable of how, well, at the end of the day, Paulie Aronson, my homie, my boy, he won worlds this year. And, you know, I, I committed, right back to US. I committed, I committed a mad hours with Paulie in order for him to prep for worlds. And I told him right before he started doing the grind, I'm like, Hey man, you you want to test with me this is a commitment bro i will test with you but like i think that it's best for this type of tournament that you're just low key and we just keep it between us and we just and we just test and test and test and test and like and the reason why is because this tournament is much smaller and i think like i think it matters for the smaller tournaments like if i'm doing the world race i think it's 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 a, it's more of a reason to to be low key if you're doing like a world's race or you're doing the or if you're or if you're, or if you're in worlds because at the end of the day like yeah. it's a it's a smaller tournament and the, the the counter picking is just so easy man and like a lot of people will counter pick you and don't think 
don't think that won't happen. It literally will, you know. It, no, it happens all the time. For sure, taken. So uh, uh, a good friend of ours is uh, Eric Christensen, and he was saying that on his ride down to Florida, uh, he was riding with another contender who was going to Worlds that day. Because obviously, <laughs> he's from Florida, but it just so happened that when he he went to Worlds uh, or attended it, it was happened to be in Florida as well. So instead of getting a nice luxurious plane and the hotel stay, they just sent out fucking a limo yeah. and, and drove his ass there with whoever else was in the area. But he was saying that, uh, hey, I, you know, I'm thinking about playing Blue Eyes. His buddy was playing something else or whatever like that. And they had a two hour drive or whatever like that to where they were going. And within that two hours, Eric Christensen had influenced them to pick up Blue Eyes and play it in that tournament. And he did fairly well, but not as well as Eric. I think Eric got second. Yeah, that's the one Eric got second place in. Uh, so. He yeah. definitely knew what he was talking about, but is that's how crazy it is to you know influence the people who are in that tournament and like you said, keeping it low key, having that sort of hey, only you and me are gonna know about this and look how far he made it type deal. It does, it oh, definitely dude. does. Some it people went, don't think it's in, insignificant, but it definitely matters. Yeah, it went it went beyond that, man. We went we tested for so many hours. I think Paulie in total, like, I think he put in a hundred and fifty hours, like into it and a lot of people will be like man that's not that much but you know it oh, it really it's like two that's, that's double overtime you know what i'm saying like yeah but you know like they have a they have a minute to prep for i think it's like a, a month at least so like 150 might feel slim to some people but at the end of the day it's hard to get those hours in in that in that type of format because nobody's playing world's format you know you, you don't get to test as much you know like paulie was was a fiend you know he would he would play against himself in order to test. So did he? Did he? Uh, did he know he was going in with uh, with Dragon Link, or was that something that you guys fell upon upon play testing? Um, it was one of our considerations for sure. Um, and uh, Kamal Kamal had a uh, had uh, put put together a list, and uh, and they were they were playing. Uh, free, you know, we, we they were playing frequently, and uh, Kamal Kamal I think had like beat him like a few matches in a row and uh we were just like all right we're just gonna keep committing to the to the to the deck um and yeah we just kept committing to it and i would just play any deck against uh Pauly, you know any deck that he would want you know i would i would i would play manadium because we thought that was another really great option for the event um we had worked on a manadium list i think that was our section second option actually um but the Dragon Link deck was just was much superior, uh, even against like the Manadium deck. Like you were just like using the Bestials to hit the hit the the, the Visa, the right cards, etc. Like it was actually kind of tough. Um, mm. It was kind of tough playing against that deck. So like I realized, yeah, like I, I thought that deck was definitely just a better call than the Manadium for sure for that event, the yeah. Dragon Link deck. And yeah, it got him there for sure. Also, just like it's just like the advantage of playing Bestials and hand traps was just yeah, it was just too much of an advantage i think and seals was just a crazy no, you, card like, seals was crazy yeah it was mvp for sure seals is definitely like the most was it was it chaos space was also hard three, for though, you, you know? guys yeah and, well the chaos three it was at three of the ocg and then a, or sorry the tcg and then it got hit to one like shortly after that they must have been keeping note of what you guys were cooking up oh yeah uh, especially but you, after uh, that because of, because of ruben also like i i was with ruben before ycs brazil and um he was trying to figure out what to play for YCS Brazil. He was so set, like he was like, so set on tier. I'm like, bro, I think I got the deck for YCS Brazil, and uh, it was Dragon Link. And yeah, surely after that, he won with Dragon Link with Kamal Crooks Same. and uh, Pack. So it was crazy, and that's what caused I think the hit on the deck because like after that, they were like, all right, we're hitting Mag, and we're hitting Chaos Base, and you know, like yeah, that's yeah. that was huge, you know. This shit needs to die. We're taking it out back once again. <laughs> or at least attempts to. Yep. But when you guys are playtesting for something like Worlds, is it... I'm just trying to find a way to word this. Would you say that you have to have more of an understanding of the way OCG plays? Or it's just so different that it's you can't even study OCG to even see how some of these players are? Because, mm. like, obviously... The lists are different than how OCG are and the TCG. So, you know, people who, who don't know who are listening, the, the world's list is completely made with the most lowest occurrences on the list from each list put together. 
So most decks are neutered if you combine both the lists. But like, is it you guys? Were you guys play testing with no, anyone this from format the OCG was so to kind of learn that? This format was just so different, man. Like this, 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 uh, this ban list was ridiculous for this for this year's worlds. Like nobody understands how many decks it was there heavy. were. There was so many options. Like no one like understands how many options that they had in front of them. Like it was honestly kind of ridiculous to figure out which deck to play with that many options. You know and. And at the end of the day, like we we just had a we just had a prep and play test constantly until we fought, uh, found out what the best option was. And thank God that we we tried to slim down the list immediately. We slimmed it down pretty pretty well to it where it was like, all right, we're playing either Rika, uh, it was like Rika, Dragon Link, Manadium, um, Math Mech, uh, and though. Okay. Those were like the real main option. Uh, there was some, there was more options that people were playing. People were thinking about playing Sword Soul. There were people playing Vanquished. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, there was so many options that you could have actually uh, decided to take. Uh, but I felt like we we fell on the right one. And the other, it's because like the other decks actually just had, we, we believed more flaws at the end of the day. And the Dragon Link deck had okay. so much recursion. And they were such more powerful. Like, you know, Labellion was crazy, dude. Like, like playing with Regain and Beast and Seals, like, you, like there was a lot of recursion. And, like, you, you were playing into non-engine super well with that deck. You have Chaos Space to bait. It was at three, you know. You, Chaos Space, they ask you. You just, like, it doesn't really matter, you know. Sometimes you just have, you have the Safer, you have no the case. Dragon, you have you have a Labellion. Yeah, you're just popping off, you know. Like, you're forcing their hand. I discarded Absorotter. I'm just searching anyway. Who cares? Yeah, you know, as long as they can get <laughs> to the seals at the end, like they're kind of chilling, you know. And anything plus on additional is just extra to the board. And you know, it could play some of the most powerful cards in the extra deck, like Barone the Flare. You know, that's like that's like a card that yeah. I want in my extra deck, and that deck was one of the decks that could play it. Like I firmly believe that Baron the Flare is one of the best cards in 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 the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Be... Like. Like yeah. and it's a very very powerful card. Like I wouldn't be surprised if I ever saw that card on the ban list. Like that card is like so generic. It's literally an, an extra mm -hmm. in the extra deck. Almost every single format you'll see it in somebody's deck. You know and yeah, like I think that I wanted that card in my deck for worlds and we we got his deck to where he's playing that. He's playing cards like this Vader. Like there was so many like real reasons why he should have played that deck. Like there was so many like. Mm -hmm hard solid reasons to play that deck it's just so much advantage i was just curious yep just because like I, I'm, I'm curious to see like what someone like you would take into consideration with with events like that like hmm, all right i want a deck that's versatile but like i don't want a deck that loses to hand traps uh so do i do i play board breakers over the hand traps what deck has inherently good uh resiliency to what's going on in the meta like it's just exactly curious to see like what you, you feel is like really strong points yeah, exactly. You hit all those points. Like you, you wanted to play a deck that that was resilient to, to, to hand traps, and that and that was also resilient to board breakers. And that's exactly what we found. That's exactly why we landed on this deck. And that's why when I brought up the other deck uh, as the other options, those decks also almost hit that mark. Um, and the thing is, the Rika deck, we, I eliminated that one a little bit more early. Pauly was really on that deck, but I, I beat the I Rika. Say, I, I beat the Rika out of him. I would have yeah. figured Rika. Oh, I yeah. beat the Rika out of him. Like that's how we got to him not playing Rika. Like, like we, beat him, we beat him Rika list. That's it. Yeah, because like at the end of the day, like I'm like, bro, you're not you're not ending on Regulus. Like you never get to Regulus. Regulus is not a real <laughs> card in this deck. Like you lose to board breakers. You're losing to Nib sometimes. You're losing to hand traps sometimes. Like this is just not good. And that's why we crossed that deck right off the list. Like that was like a no, a definite no go. And then, um, and then we played Minadium, and the Minadium deck is was our second option because. Yeah, dude, you put up reframing and your whole board is just game. It's actually just game. Like you're not losing. But the issue is sometimes you don't it's get funny, to reframing because yeah. if you don't get to if you don't get to to the room heart, then you're not getting to the you're not getting to where you need to get to. And like that was the biggest issue. But you know what? I was onto something. I was onto something for that format because uh his deck list for the Manadium deck that that we that we considered as the second option was very different than like any Minadium deck that you would see. Like I was playing like Ziamin, I was playing like Itelli, I was playing like, uh, I was playing a way to make Ancient Fairy. So this way, when I start opening uh, Room Heart, uh, when, I, when I open Re Reich Heart, I mean, 
uh, I can get to the field spell mm -hmm. with the link one. And then I was making ancient fairies to blow up my field spell to then get me into the, to, into the Manadium field spell and then do, and yeah, then, and yeah, just do full yeah, combo. I and like, that. and, uh, that's crazy. and that, and that's what we were doing for that format. So like, yeah, my deck was like for, for Manadium was really solid for, for like, in terms of making the board, like we were, we we're pretty much making the, the end board almost every single time. But the difference was like, yeah. like the deck I felt like was definitely like it wasn't, it wasn't that bad into draw. I feel like I felt like it was sometimes still putting up a board through drill. Like some hands would die to drill, some hands won't. Like some hands you just play through drill like it's no tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, but there's some hands that will actually get blown out by drill. Like Manadium always has that weakness. Right. Um, but it's also we bring that up too, the ancient fairy dragon. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. We were just talking about it on the podcast last week. Yeah, that's that, the uh, thing. Manadium that... is probably like the best combo deck in the format. And it, re it resembles Dragon Link because of how it interacts and like the way it's all right. We're we're shifting from Spielfeld for this engine now, and then now we're going from uh, Fenrir searching the Scare Claw to now we're on Reichhart. Reichhart go for Visa. Visa. We're now popping Meeks. Meeks is special, and now we're synchro. And now you know it's a very very intricate deck. So and it, the ceiling, as you said, is very very high. It does have an Achilles heel to like cards like Droll or like obviously Shifter, but like you know a lot of decks do. So as far as picks like this we were just talking about how strong that deck is so i can see why you were definitely juggling both of those like those picks because they're relatively uh if you put them as far as lineage they may have a different lines of play but they both end on like the same variation we're gonna put a couple of, like really strong links out we're gonna put a couple of the broken synchros out and hope our opponent can't like we're gonna hope we can eat a couple hand traps along the way because this hand have our opponent hand loop themselves so very very strong picks yeah the, the, and at the end of the day, the, the the Dragon Link deck was just it was just the choice because like it just had so many so many ways to play through the interactions. Like even if you got Shifter, like there was just lines that you could take. Like sometimes you could like summon like a Magnemite, banish their guy, tribute Magnemite off the board, summon Lebellion straight out your hand because you could summon Lebellion off the hand as well. And then like, you could put like a Regain or a Beast on the board, and then now you just normal summon. You make a Seals, and like look, your board's like a trap in the seals like sometimes like through through a shifter you know like that's the thing like like in awkward situations yeah. the, the dragon link could still prevail like that's like the thing about it it was like there were so many like there's always a line in that deck there was always yeah. a line and that's it's we funny, wanted my, to adapt my boy, multiple Dr lines my boy devon actually plays dragon link or he did he did play dragon Link. he hasn't played uh, in a very long time just because he's on this fire combo shit which is healthy for him i'm glad but he played that's dragon cool. link for oh, god like two three years and he was just to the point where like, the same way he just knew every single line it was just so resilient and it just took forever to get him off that deck because it was just such a, a strong deck like he he knew that even with all these hits he was still trying to make it work and that it, it, you may just cut him off from one av avenue but like then there's people who like shoe ping and, and people who are just gonna like renovate the deck and and now it's uh what it is right now which is still pretty strong like, even with magnema and chaos space to one i still think that it has the capabilities of winning a ycs yeah 100 percent. it's just like it just depends on the format at the end of the day like like going into the next format it's going to be tough for that deck to compete because there's a lot of fire decks and a lot of non-dark decks but like in the formats where mm -hmm. dark and light decks like are good, then Dragon Link just becomes a great deck because like now their bestials, in the back. their bestials are just you know just powerful. They're like they're they're non-engine cards plus engine cards, which w w is which w what you want, you know, like like turning no, those into engine, turning those like engine cards into non-engine cards is just plus. And like that's the thing with Dragon Link, it's like it's it's so format dependent, and it was just. Yeah, the toolbox is crazy, yeah. but it does rely on the format for sure. Yeah, Big exactly. Max. Because of the because of the bestial aspect. You like bestial like the bestial aspect, you like it's cool to banish stuff at your own grave, but you know, it's like sometimes you won't be able to always put cards in your grave. You'd rather it be in a format mm -hmm. where you could have it's doing multiple things. Even before I went to that Catscale regional, I took the Horus or the Bestial engine out of my Horus Orcus deck just due to the fact that I expected it to be a lot of Fire King. And as you saw, there was definitely a lot of Fire King in that room, uh, whether it was Fire King Tri Brigade, Fire King Pure, or Fire King with the Snake Eye shit in there. There was just so much of it. And I just didn't think the Bestials were going to do enough against any of the uh, Rogues. I mean, you probably might have did something maybe round one or two, but like events like that are 9, 10, 11 rounds. And I just didn't think it was going to do good late game, which is what you always, uh, you know, account for and try to play test for. 
and I just took it out. I was just like, yeah, this is not going to do well. I'm, I'm winding up banishing my own Orcus cards just to combo. And if I don't get the Death Potter, I'm not bringing them back. I'm not seeing the water yeah. get them back out the bandage. It's like a whole bunch of just like, you know, things just like, all right, yeah, fuck it, take it out. So I can understand like that being strong. But like, yeah, you're right. Anytime there's a dark or a light, I uh, guess guaranteed that uh, Dragon Link is going to be in the pack lurking in the shadows waiting yeah. to strike. The best deal package in general, man. Like, I, I love that package. Uh, I love that package, but it's just a format dependent package, you know. It's it's such a good package though. Like they're un- they're unfair. Right they're they're unfair, you know. Yeah, they're so unfair. The format had to shift into fires just to stop them. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Like the, the Bistial cards just uh, they just do too much, you know. Like they could they could hit cards in your your opponent's grave, which just just leads to too much advantage. Like you're you're getting a stop in a body. Like it's too much. Plus, you drew a swarm, especially because. That's also just now removing a card on the field once it leaves. Like Drew Swarm is definitely, definitely too crazy, like of a card. Yeah. Uh, but Drew Swarm got hard. But Magnemite, Magnemite is a uh, Magnemite is is good that it went to it went to one because that card was an issue. But honestly, like I could have seen him just banning it. One is still kind of like weird when your opponent opens it. It's kind of tough. Honestly, yeah. And your opponent is still being it able to switch the Lebellion. Yeah. So. Everyone's playing fires now too. If my opponent opens Magnum, but I'm like, eh, eh, you can get it. We're gonna. Oh yeah, no, yeah. You better have it's... another dark. You you better have a dark guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the game the game is. Totally uh, but moving honest. on, I guess into. Yeah. No, you continue. Yep. What was that? Nope. Good. I'm ready to go on to the next category. Uh yeah. Uh, just yeah. uh moving on into current format. Uh, looking at over the weekend, we had the Latin America's remote YCS that took place. Uh, and it was actually won by none other than Horus Tier Limits. So Tier Limits takes on another event. Uh, so they won the entire thing. Uh, was that something, before we dive into the technical things, is just Tier Limits winning another YCS surprising to you as someone who actually won a YCS with Tier Limits and against one of the best players notably in the game? Um, I don't think it, it surprises me, honestly. Like, it's just I'm study, man. Like, there, there's no way, like, there's no way this could have been done without M Study. So shout out to M Study and the Horus package for doing what it needs to do. Those cards are ridiculous. Uh, they have the recursion with with Sarcophagus, and I just think that it just raises the ceiling of that deck being able to just now get rid of cards like uh, get, get rid of cards like Mali or like these additional plus ones out your hand, Trivakarma and giving you two bodies to make now zombie vampire in a format where people are probably not like like you know like milling four off the top of your opponent's deck is probably not going to affect you as much in your tier element deck you know you're probably just okay with it you know you're probably plusing way more than your opponent is and like the deck yeah, is the still... only thing i think you don't want to hit is like orcus or like labyrinth transactions yeah. and like a trap or something and and tier limit is not terrible you know i think that deck is still like like a deck that can compete no, uh, in, the, in the current yeah. format once the fire format comes around you know it's totally different i don't think uh i don't think that deck is uh really gonna be like that great but currently in the in the game now yeah man that deck's pretty solid you know like they have sully to mill mm-hmm. they have scream to mill they, they still have these plus ones that give them additional cards that like that uh, will get them ahead of the game, you know? So, I mean, as long as you're playing those they cards... Just mound, yeah. Yeah, there's they still, still a lot of good man, mills, you know? There's still a lot of good mills. And, you know, the consistency of the deck definitely is still up there. You know, you're probably still being able to play cards like Fenrir at three. You know, there's there's mm-hmm. probably just a lot of things that you could do within the deck in order to, in order to you know, prep for the format. Also, like, you could fit a yeah, few non engine in your deck as well. So maybe like some. Boy we have a, a couple, yeah. We got a couple of players at uh, our locals. Like shout outs to Brendan. Uh, I think he actually watches a lot of your videos and content too, just because he admires the competitive aspect of the game. Uh, but he plays the elements, and he's not even playing the horse package. He's just playing, uh, like you said, the the malicious, the Mali, whatever it is, with the uh, uh, dangerous, and then he's playing the Beatrice Sen. He's got the SP uh, cards like. Uh, uh fucking the sharks to bring out toad like there's yeah, a exactly. bunch of ways that's, that they can even exactly if you cut them off from fusion there's definitely putting up boards they're still linking and xyz and like crazy so it's it's still it's a tough board to put up regardless of if they're even activating a Merly, uh a fucking shaylin a, a haveness in the graveyard to begin with yeah and that's a, i think that's exactly what the strategy was just making the bahamut boards with beatrice 
it's just a lot of advantage, you know. And I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, it got him there. I mean, it's it's a it, it's it's not that shocking to me. I think Tier Element is a is a great deck, and I mean, at the end of the day, if luck is on your side, you know. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, if you really, want a casino like, and your luck is high, yeah, if your you luck might is, cash out. Yeah, you know, you <laughs> could just win. You know, like that's just how that deck is. That's right. And looking at this top breakdown, we have uh, the top 32 for this event. Looks like we have five Labyrinth, four Rescue Ace, four Fire King, three Sprite, which is surprising to me, two Tier, which wasn't that surprising, two Minadium, we talked about that, two Cash Tira, two uh, Vanquish Souls, two Flunderies, that one was surprising, uh, one Orcus, one Chimera, one Super Heavy Runic, don't know what the fuck that was, uh, one Trap Trick, one what's that surprising one adventure scare claw and then one phantom knight i wanted to see if that's pure and i'm gonna have to find that out and uh, get that back to you guys on that uh going into a top 16 of three fire king two labyrinth two rescue ace which we've all talked about today uh two sprite two cash tira two vanquish soul the one tier player one manadium and one flu um, breaking that into the top eight, looks like we eliminate half of this. Going into two Fire King, two Vanquish Soul, a Sprite, a Rescue Ace, a Labyrinth, and a Tier. With your quarterfinals going with against two Vanquish Souls, a Tier, and a Labyrinth player. And then we have the finals being Tier versus Vanquish Souls. But you obviously guys know that Tier took it away. Uh, the uh, profile can be uh, seen on the Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro deck that you guys can check out and go see what he played just if you guys want the list. Uh, but just know that there are budget versions of it. Uh, not to say that it's going to be super, super friendly just because of the fact that once one, one thing gets reprinted, other things spike. Maybe something like a Rhino Heart or whatever might uh, you might see some extra bucks on. But if you go pick up the uh, deck core right now, it's relatively uh, cheap, especially with uh, Rarity Collection 2 bringing in the planets all in uh, whatever rarities they're going to bring them in. So yeah, definitely a, a diverse speaking of top cut like it's a very very diverse like and i know before we uh take off about in or at least do our last segment that some people argue that they don't like diverse formats because they hinders what what they say would be like um the amount of uh, estimated guessing that they can do because you can't account for 50 decks you can only account for however many your deck can allow you for uh so what is your standpoint on diversity do you like many decks in the format or do you uh, like triangle or tier zero formats more uh kind of like when you won your ycs when we were in uh, tier zero format yeah so uh me personally i really would like to say that i'm more of a a more of a tier zero type of guy or like a, a more of a triangle type of format type of player um at the end of the day like i mean it's fine to play in any other format like and i've done exceptionally well in those other formats but you know like there's it's just like it's kind of tough when when you're in a diverse format it's tough to win like you know like at the end of the day like the the, the diverse formats like it's tough to win because sometimes you just get clipped bro like you can you can, you know, you can only prepare for so much. And like, sometimes you verse something that you're not prepared for and you just lose, you know? And like, and like, and that's why I try to like mainly focus on like being sure that you're, you're you know, to expect as much as possible, you know? And sometimes just not, you know, me personally, like I am very knowledgeable in the game and I will still lose to like something like, like something that's like not like prepped for, you know? Like oh, something. Yeah, exactly. Because like yeah. at the end of the day, like you're just not prepped for it, or you you know you haven't been familiar with it in a while, and you know like sometimes it can get you there. And at the end of the day, like that's the thing. Like I feel like you just have to be like knowledgeable for those things. Like and and diverse formats usually like you will you will run into that more. You know because like I was going to tournaments this year. You know this is this is why like the, my 2023 season wasn't so great. Because, like, I went to tournaments all year long and I'm versing, like, eight different decks. You know, it's it's hard to beat eight mm-hmm. different decks, you know? Like, you know, how do you even side deck for eight different decks? You just don't, you know? Like, that's the thing. Like, some matchups are just going to be bad. And, like, that's the thing. Like, when I was playing in these diverse formats, you're, you were kind of just, like, taking the loss to certain decks if you versed it, you know? And, like, I feel like that was the biggest issue within that format, like, if you versed a certain matchup, you would just have to, to, to like take an L to it, and like, and that's yeah, the issue with that. Di- yeah. And that's and that's the issue with like diverse formats. Like, there's so many decks that sometimes that like, all right, you know, this is a bad match. If you run into it, like, you could get cooked. 
And um, at the end of the day, when I uh, at like nationals, right? Like that that was tough, right? I, I took I took a couple a couple weird losses in the tournament. Like I lost to a guy that was playing uh, Tash Tira Vanquish Soul, right? And uh, I had went I had went first. Uh, he had stopped me. I had like went set a book of moon, had like an ash. He started his turn off with unicorn. I book a moon it. No, he started off his turn with pressured planet, and that deck usually breaks. So you uh, like uh, we just thought it was correct, hundred percent to ash it. So I ash pressured planet. Yeah. He summons unicorn. I book a moon it. Oh, no, it wasn't it wasn't unicorn. It was friendly, and I book a moon it. And then he went uh, normal summon uh, uh, rising, and I just lost that game. And like like that was just uncontrollable because like really like vanquish soul wasn't like that popular towards that point it was like yeah, I, it was like i was familiar with the matchup but like yeah like i'm more prepped for cash tira like you know like everyone's playing cash and like when you're versing cash you're ashing the field spell you're book mooning the monster you know and he just had raisins so you're I just supposed lost. to be cooked this is it <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, like, I followed like, the instructions yeah, he's yeah, supposed to yeah, pass he's, yeah he's supposed to pass right yeah, yeah, yeah no, but no he just doesn't pass you know he summoned raisin and i lose that game and uh like that was one of my losses at nationals for example like you can't really like like I couldn't prep for that. Like I'm just like oh, I just got cooked. You know I thought I was playing cash and it just wasn't. You know and and I got cooked and then like uh, and then game three, uh, I I honestly can't remember what it, what it determined on. But um, at the end of the day, that's I know that's what cost me game one. And like you know that's all it takes sometimes because you know like going first is a huge advantage in in game three situation. So. And my other loss was like to Manadium, no. uh, to Manadium Cash as well. Uh, yeah, Manadium Cash as well. And I fell into like the same issue where, uh, where like he started off with his Cash cards, and I kind of had it to react to it with them. Like I was versing Pat, and like yeah, like I versed Hoban at that event, and uh, he started off with like a friend rear, and like you just have to book that. Like it, and at the end of the day, like he had that additional extender because Manadium usually does pass turn to Book of Moon, uh, in some scenarios, but. Uh, in that scenario, he had like like the extender plus the normal, and yeah, he just had like yeah, a lot of. Yeah, you got it. You just got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was tough. No, uh, I can understand that. Yeah. So I mean, it's, 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 I just yeah, I was. But those decks were not. I was just popular, curious to see. You know? Yeah. The, those decks. Yeah, were exactly. Not, I wouldn't like, that, that's I would like, consider that, them meta decks. Exactly. Yeah. That's nationals. Though. Like that's nationals. You know, I'm just saying. Like, like I just lost two decks that like Manadium, Manadium, Cash Tira. Like he played Unicorn. He played like a bunch of cash cards. You know, like. The end of the day, I lost to Manadium Cash Tira. I lost to uh, Vanquish Little Cash Tira. Uh, and, you know, like, uh, yeah, like, at the end of the day, like, I couldn't really, you know, uh, control those games. Uh, I, I can't remember. Yeah, but that's not, like, something me, but, I, I mean, would say, like, because Cash is definitely represented enough at the point, especially in national season, where it would be something where, like, all right, if this is pure Cash, I'm cooked either way, so let me just hit this and, like, hope it's pure. Like, if you misread it because they only give one engine or insight to one engine, like, you only know so much of going in blind, you know what I'm saying? So, like, yeah. you can only do so much. So, you still played it right, you know? It's, it's just the fact that there was just other engines mixed with the Cash Tier because Cash Tier is so strong of a splashable engine within itself. Yeah, like the Cash Tira cards uh, was was a very strong engine, but I just thought that the Pure Deck was uh, like very inconsistent, and like that's really why that we didn't we didn't land on it. And like the, like the mirror sometimes just felt super uncontrollable. We all kind of landed on Purely, uh, and like at the end of the day, we thought Purely was a great option. Uh, I thought it really was a really great option. Well, I, I yeah, felt I like Chris was on it for a bit too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Chris couldn't play Nationals. If, if he could have, like, who knows what could have happened, you know? And, and Kamal yeah, lost yeah. to D-Barrier in top eight, you know? Not something, not something like, that he could have really controlled. Like, he be like he better draw one of his one of his two D-Barriers that was in his main deck, and he did, you know? And he went to world. Like, Enzo went to world that way. But at the end of the day, if he didn't draw his D-Barrier, who knows, man? Kamal could have been our national champion at the end of the day. <laughs> so, like... Yeah, absolutely. You never know. Yeah. Butterfly effect, dog. But yeah, that's what like that's what I think about the like uh, the variety, like the 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 variety format. Like when there's too much variance, like you could just lose to anything, and like that's like the thing. Like you can't really expect it all. Like people were literally playing anything. Like and like that's the thing. Yeah. So like, I mean, I, obviously, you like more like defi define you know a couple handful of like uh. It's not like defined format. It's more like of like it's like okay these decks are just too powerful for the game. Like, and that's all it is. Like, at the end of the day, these mm -hmm. decks are too powerful in the game 
So who's who's gonna play it best? This is this deck That's is a, clearly so on broken. The pilot too. Yeah, this 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 deck is clearly broken. Now who's gonna play it better? And that's the thing. Like that's that that's that's, that's why I think like that's why I think like formats that are tier zero are like so beneficial. Like yeah, like who's gonna really play it better? But you know, sometimes you know it's uncontrollable. Like sometimes you will take the uncontrollable in a in a in a format like this. But a lot of the time it it can be controlled because like your deck is so powerful that if your opponent starts making mistakes it's now controllable and like that's the thing like like it's never really an auto loss in a, in a format like this because it's based off your opponent making the proper plays and making mistakes like and that will happen no matter who you're versing no matter if you're versing me Chris Jesse uh Christian Urena pack it doesn't matter people make mistakes like people will mess up and like at the end of the day like that's what you got to no, capitalize perfect. on this format and a format that's tier zero you have to capitalize on your opponent's mistakes at all costs yeah like for tier element you could look back at the finals at the end of the day game three that is not a winnable game for me not a winnable game at all i don't win that game three times over three times over i don't win that game he had to make three mistakes in order for me to even win that event and like People don't realize it. It was a super back and forth final. So like, it's hard to realize, it's hard to catch. There was a lot of interactions. There was a lot of things that were going on. But yes, he made three crucial mistakes that led to my victory in order to win. And and was it like, was it his fault that he made those mistakes? Yes, of course. You, you also yeah, one take, hand, yeah. You have to take, you have to Behind take accountability. But like at the end of the day, like it's, it, it, it's a lot to intake, you know. There's a lot of things going on in the game, and mistakes do happen. It's a long, yeah, like a long high, day, the long day, and you know, it, it's the finals. I know in those crucial moments, you would want to be at, at like, be at a point where you're not making mistakes, but you know, it does happen at the end of the day. Like it can happen to the best of us, but I think that in those formats, like yeah, like you just have to be playing better than your opponent to win. Like and like that, I felt like that's how I felt at at that event. Like I felt like I was just on top of the like on top of things that i needed to be on like i the one thing i missed out on i should have just played zeus i didn't uh, maybe even redo her but at the end of the day like uh, it, it didn't matter to the point where my deck wasn't wasn't playable like i had the real advantage i had the real i had the real advantage by just playing six bestials in my deck which is something that people weren't doing they were like playing four to three and i was just like but like I kind of yeah. think these cards are broken, where I just want to play six of them, um, and yeah, they, they they were great. I mean, and I just he played like oh, the, the same amount, but I think he played less Magnumuts. But I was I was certain that I wanted Magnum at three in my deck. Um, yeah, for sure. But his logic was pretty good. I would say like he didn't want uh, people to target it when it gets milled. But like yeah. I, I didn't care if there was two to three, you know. Like I, I didn't mind it. I was just I was running it up. I was playing three of them. But uh, the other format, the other format that I would like to speak about, because there's a mo there was multiple tier zero formats, and I want to like touch up on like on majority of them, so I can give you the the best answer here. Because like in tier zero formats, like I feel like there's so much there's so much more to bring to the table. Like when it comes down to like come down to technical play, uh, and tier I feel like should say it on its own because like tier brought up like the best of like the majority of the top dwarfs in the game right like jesse won on that in that year uh jesse won he he also versed paulie in the finals all right the one that he won which was huge right and yeah and like when i when i also won and i also versed jesse in the finals that one which is like you know like it's still like that means a lot i think like when when there's two great players in the finals like i think that's for a reason you know um uh, and Absolutely. Christian Urena won two times in tier limit format, twice. Like, that is like, that is huge for him. You know, like he he get, he caught two Ws in that format. For Chris LeBlanc, he caught two Ws within tier element as well. I know one was before Ishizu's, but he also caught two Ws. So like, at the end of the day, like, and like, what does that say? Like, I mean, like, that's just, I mean, that in its own. Like, the, all those top players, they all already had a we already had achievements you know we we had already gotten so much already from the game but you know we just we all just won again and i think that's clearly because 
of the format and the skill gap in a tier zero format. And that's, and like, and yeah, so I, I would like to say 100% that majority of the time it's better to play in a, in a tier zero format because the skill gap is higher. But like, yeah, diversity is, is great. Like, I like the, I like the, like, I like sometimes playing the game when it's diverse. And I know like, like a lot more other people, like a lot of other people like in, enjoy playing di against different decks. There's different options, but at the end of the day, like if you're really wanting to put it on skill and like put it on player gap, putting it on knowledge straight up, it's, it's these tier zero formats, it's triangle format, stuff like that. Like, yeah, like they kind of, you kind of just see like mm -hmm. who, who, who grabs like wins in those types of formats, like uh, Orcus format 2019. Uh, I feel like Orcus was clearly, clearly the best deck in like towards the end of 2019. Uh, it might have even yeah. been the, the best deck Aren't before away. it, and we might have just caught on late at the end of the day. Because like I think that Orcus was just absurd, you know, as a as a deck, and that deck mm -hmm. caught a lot of Ws by a lot of great players as well. You know, like uh, um, Romero had won twice in that year, and I know Romero has not been playing as of recently but i think he won twice that year because because of the like the way the format was and he was knowledgeable in the game and he was knowledgeable in the format and and yeah and he was like just on a tear in that format um same goes for spiral format you know a uh, spiral format was just another great format multiple great players won in that singular format it's just there's like so many good formats for, for tier zero where you you've seen the better player win, and Jesse was in a lot of those. Jesse actually was one in a yeah. lot of those formats. Yeah, yeah. So he's, like, a, he's one. Of, I arguably say he's one of the best players. He, to ever he won in that player. Orcus like, format, and he won in that Spiral format. It's most of his majority yeah. of his wins were also in these tier zero formats, and like, and like that's something mm -hmm. to mention here. Like the Thunder format, like that the, that was another format where it was like a triangle format. He won in that format as well. Um, and I think like his only yeah, variety more, format yeah, a lot more was competitive players Unchained. Like that. Yeah, and the only one I would say that wasn't like a variety format was Unchained, and that was pretty much it, you know. But like other than that, like majority of his wins were also like in a, in a in a variety format, or not in a variety format, in a, uh, in a pretty much a, a triangle format. So. Yeah, because I, I mean, a lot of the competitive players do fall on the opinion of triangle to, to tier zero just due to the things behind the the scenes that work with uh com competitive Yu-Gi-Oh as far as like uh deck prepping, deck building, knowledge, gameplay, interactions, how does my deck interact with this deck? Uh I'm more obviously uh designed to see this deck, so what is it hinder to? Cool, my side deck can now work with that, but when you got a side deck for like 50 things, if you lose if you're losing to like Lyra Lusk and then you're losing to Cyber Dragon and then you're losing to fucking heroes or you know some other you know bullshit then you, you can't really account for every single deck so triangle formats are more like uh where people can get the most uh skill in as you said because i've always said that uh although i love diversity and shit like that, i'm a diversity lover myself if i'm the casual side of me but if i'm being uh more competitive or if i'm being serious for myself or, or, or others i say that not only is triangle format good, but it, it, eventually it doesn't even come down to the deck anymore. It just comes down to the pilot. It comes down to how, like you said, how good you are and how perfect you play without making misplays and uh, staying on course and not being fatigued and not letting the pressure get to you and making sure that you're on point for 45 minutes to 55 minutes depending on it oh and you've done this for two days straight and you haven't probably eaten because of the rounds are you know so back to back to back so there's a lot of things that go into it so uh to have things a little bit easier by knowing at least what my opponent might be playing on odds is a little bit easier when you're trying to prepare for these big events and put that big old weight in your back and walk with it uh, makes things at least the trail a little easier i would agree to, to the standpoint but one last uh segment before we uh close out tonight i know you guys uh have been with us here for a bit and i appreciate you guys still listening uh we have the favorite segment for everyone i don't know why it's your favorite i, I do a couple other fun segments fuck you guys uh, but this one is the people's choice questions. We have asked our Discord server 
and other various chats uh what they uh should ask honey if they were in person and get like whatever questions you can they can be personal they can be silly uh whatever it is so be sure to join the people's choice uh section of the discord channel uh which is linked down in that link tree uh, with the description box below uh, but this first question comes for us from Mel DeBottis from Heart of the Podcast. Yeah, shout out to Mel DeBottis and shout out to Heart of the Podcast, uh, our brother sister podcast. Uh, he asks, uh, if he's willing to talk about it, how was it his experience with luxury gaming and what is it like having Yu-Gi-Oh! focused business uh, and sort of being the face of it yourself? Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, man, it's definitely tough being in a position where you're running uh like a team or a company and also like and also like playing in the game and like at the end of the day like i was i was more i was i'm doing both and i'm still doing it kind of currently you know uh i don't really like manage a team like that uh, i have a friend that's currently starting his own team you know a uh, high frequency game uh, Michael Sniba and I do help him obviously with the with the team stuff because based off experience I could I can help him you know give him some good advice on like how to just like stay afloat you know because it's not easy running a team um, uh, for the business side of the things like yeah like I mean it's 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 tough you know there's finances you know that you have to you have to account for like like budgets for sure in terms of like like paying out players and stuff so you know it's 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 profitable for sure though because uh, at the end of the day like you you get to you get to release merch you get to uh you, you get to get eyes and at the end of the day like eyes is really what it is like you want eyes so people can like you know purchase stuff on your store or, or you could like or you could just like get the, like interactions with attention. with people you know tensions with people and at the end of the day like getting people's attention is what is what brings sales to the table, you know, is what makes opportunities happen. So um, at the end of the day, like, that's what I feel like your benefit of like starting a team is, you know, and, and like doing things within the community, mm -hmm. you know, raising money, etc. So. What do you think the difference is between having your own team and like being on a team like uh, luxury? Um, yeah, dude, like, like is I it mean, weird, like when you got to pay your own flights or like, is there things that you got to do now that you didn't have to do when you were on a, another team? um yeah i would say like dude honestly like i feel like still like you know i'm still around the same people you know like at the end of the day like i i don't really like you know switch up you know like i'm still around a lot of the people that I, you know that i was with no no i'm just talking about like it, opportunity wise like is there anything that like it, you've like all right yeah maybe i couldn't go to this event because i couldn't afford to because i got to pay for my own pocket that like luxury would be like oh yeah no problem yeah you Here's your ticket, or you know. No, whatever. I feel like it. Are there other opportunities? I feel yeah, like the like card pool. I don't know. Like it's all just like within the business cost, you know. I feel like, uh, and and still, it's still within. Like I'm still trying to keep it that way within the company that like that uh, Sanaiba is doing. You know, like a uh, high frequency game where it's kind of just getting paid for within the company. You know, within within profits within the company. You know, and like that's kind of like mm. what your what your goal should be set to be, where these flights are not now just being paid for by you, but being paid for uh, by the revenue that you're intaking within your business. And like, and I mean, it's still to, like till this day going like that way for me, you know? Uh, and mm -hmm. yeah, at, at the end of the day, like as long as you, as you just like keep on track and hopefully just uh, advertise and get yourself to a scenario where you're actually making profit off your company, you could cover those expenses. Um, because at the end of the day, I think like uh, being known is, is profitable being like, being familiar within the community is profitable you know like mm -hmm. uh yeah. because you know people are more likely to sell to you as a trusted person within the community uh and i feel like that's just something that is just huge you know like uh in terms of online sales you know like people are people are always constantly hitting you up trying to sell things uh to, to your business etc they other people want to see you do well succeed so like i feel like that's like the thing about a, a team like at the end of the day like that's how you succeed uh within the team and you know like always coming up with different avenues to benefit both parties you know the team and other players outside of it um i think is big you know um but i really try to step away from like the team thing right now my sponsor does 
does like do a lot. I wasn't trying to be on a team before uh, like Source Gaming. Like I, I wasn't really uh, looking to join any type of team. Uh, but sometimes you just get offers you really can't refuse, you know, like and what I mean by that is like, yeah, like accommodations, like at the end of the day. But like I know that I had to put in a certain amount of work on my end for in order for those accommodations to happen. And like that's something that like people don't really understand, you know, like what what does it take to actually go to every event? You know, like there's a there's a lot that is involved in that, you know, like there yeah, there's absolutely. a lot on the back end, like, you know, I'm doing a lot on the back end in order to to make profit, to make revenue, you know, like I just started my own site for learn CCD. Um, and like, and like to, to like, and that's like something that I want to be, you know, like that's like just an extra revenue so I can continue to do what I'm doing, yeah. you know? And, uh, I'm just trying to get attention to high frequency games now. And, you know, I'm going to really focus up on the social media uh, aspect mm -hmm. of that. Um, and uh get that and get that going you know so i think like that's my no, main, that. main step for high frequency you know is just just kind of getting their name on yeah. the map and like the main way of doing that is obviously like just performing well and my team performing well and you know this year uh uh like having kamal win high frequency that was great and you know la last year paulie you know he just you know he won uh he won worlds you know under high worlds, frequency literally yeah the best under, player yeah one under high frequency you know so high frequency caught two big dubs last year you know ycs brazil 3v3 mm. and worlds you know on like straight off of the launch two months yeah it was just, not even like within the same month i think it was all in the same month i think yeah i think that all happened within the same month pretty much uh That's world crazy. and talk yeah. about a launch date right yeah so that was crazy you know and 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 the team is small you know the team is like four people so <laughs> yeah we, yeah which is why i kind of tacked that on to the end of mel's question just yeah. because yeah. Uh, i know for a fact it's different when you have to do it yourself versus when you have other people doing it for you so that's why i asked if there was like anything that it's, like was different between having like still, that team or it, money behind you before yeah, yeah it's still kind of the same like uh, on an aspect like of like you know like uh what i was trying to say earlier like i'm still with the same people so like it, it, we're still doing like the same thing like we're trying to get to the where we're like you know we're trying to get a hotel together etc like it's just like it's coordinating like that's the biggest thing in running a team i think you know is like like how like what's the plan for the weekend how are we all going to stay together you know how do we make plans because making plans is not easy you know so, like plans don't just happen you know you have to make them happen you have to make things resolve like how like you, you can't just go into a restaurant of like with like 20 people like somebody has to book it you know what i'm saying like and those are the things that when you're running a team those are the type of things that, that will come up like all right dinner reservations hotel like those accommodations like how are we getting to the event are we staying near the event those are the type of accommodations that you're dealing with when you're when you're uh, like running a team and and if you're managing a team but like i was saying before i'm still with the same people so like a lot of the time we still fall into that same issue. So like that issue never really like there's a way, you know, it's still like always there. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's fair. You know, I, I was just curious myself, I, you know, adding onto that. And then the uh, last question that we have for our uh, people's choice questions are, uh, comes to us anonymously, actually. So the no name, uh, it comes to us from our discord, which reads, uh, what in your words makes someone a good competitive player? Uh, i.e. topping results, high DB rating, technical gameplay, etc. What do you, I'm assuming, is what do you consider to be a good competitive player? Or what qualities would they have? Uh, somebody that's dedicated, consistent, trying to grind, get better, is like, I feel like is, is what makes somebody a good competitive player. Like, if you're, if you're on Dueling Book and you're grinding consistently and you're just like, like playing rated whatever you know trying to become the like trying to become the best playing people for money in order to in order to just get games in in order to just get better um playing tournaments consistently just like anything that's just like trying to up your gameplay trying to make yourself a, a bigger threat within the game is what i think makes a good player and like making yourself a threat is what makes you a good player is knowing that You've been playing so much that you, you know that now other people like view you as a threat in the game. 
and that and 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 like that i think is huge is a as an answer because i mean that can go for a lot of people that i've like recently like at the end of the day, i've been around now for you know for a minute and i've been seeing other people in the game come up you know and um mm-hmm. and and how do i hear about these people or how do i know about these certain people like um for example jib and so um John Pittman, uh, Lucas Sacco, Aditya, I can I can go on. These these players are known. Why are they known now within well, like within the competitive standpoint of like competitive players? Well, they're known because they're they're putting the hours in on dueling book. They're grinding. They're going to regionals now. After grinding like for hours, right? Then they're doing well at these events because they're testing. And then they're accumulating points. Now they're in the race. Now they're, you know, and now people are viewing them. And like, that's something that's like, you know, that's a way to get yourself like known, you know, like you, you just grind on dueling book. You, you, you prep for a tournament, you show up to the tournament, you do well, and you just do it again the next week. And if that's, if you're doing the world's race, that's like a way to get ahead. And, you know, Lucas Sacco, uh, Aditya, um, you know, they, they pretty much got their, their names out there. Uh, Sean Pittman. Um, they all got their names really out there based off of just like doing that in itself. Like they were all playing last year, you know, like, uh, and they were like, not, they were like, they were probably not as known as they are now is what, is what I would say, you know, like, and I think that's something that's, that's, you know, that's huge, you know, and, 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 should be noted. and, uh, same thing, like, like Denny Vu, you know, like he's been, he's been in the game for a while, you know, and, uh, at the end of the day, like he has no real, like, super major accomplishments maybe a, a maybe a few ICS tops but you know at the end of the day he is in the race and you know like people will view him as a threat and that's because he's playing consistently he's trying to and he's trying to you know get there and accomplish something so at the end of the day I think like what makes a good player is somebody that's putting in the work putting in the hours and trying to actually do better and that's what makes a good player they just gotta have that dog in him you know yeah 100%. it's gotta be that thoroughbred Yep. <laughs> uh, but we are starting to run out of life points, guys. Uh, I wanted to start to conclude things. I uh, just want to thank our guest, Hani, for coming out. So before we close out, reminded of all the things above. Of course, Linktree link, click on it, follow all the social medias, doing giveaways. So be sure to share and follow and all that shit. Subscribe, like, all that. Uh, interact, I guess, is what the point is. Uh, Unplug Gaming, check out their Discord. Also, description box below down there. You guys already know the deal. Brad, every Saturday, Twitch, live stream, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For those who are outside of the United States, that is the East Coast Eastern Standard Time for uh, his streams. Uh, you can join him deck building, crafting, playing Master Duel, EDO Pro, whatever it is you guys like to play. You guys can interact with him there. And you guys will be on our Friday night wrap up, so our Friday night episode. Uh, also, with that being said, I'd like to thank Hani for coming on here and uh, basically sh- picking his mind as I really wanted to and just sharing this inside information with uh, not only me, but you guys as well. Uh, are, are there any uh, last shout outs or any uh, final thoughts on the show or anything like that that you guys have you want to give out? Um, no, nah, I really appreciate you having me on. I guess I'll give uh, LearnTCG.com one last shout out. You guys want to check that out for uh, for coaching. I'm always accepting people. I do coaching. I do coaching sessions. Uh, I, I pretty much private sessions i'm pretty much available all hours of the day and you can book me uh through my site and it allows you to select an hour when you do if you do a private session and if you book through the classroom uh you get added to the court that day and uh yeah you can get straight into testing once you get added so um yeah that's i mean that's it for me absolutely so maybe if we get enough hype for that maybe for one of the giveaways we'll uh purchase an hour for you and we'll donate it away to one lucky uh, listener who can you know basically get one hour of uh Hani's time or whoever else is in the discord any of the other ycs topping notables in there uh and we'll be sure that we can give back to you guys as well as to the people who support us uh, being Hani and everyone over there at high frequency gaming uh and we can set something up for you guys if you guys show choose just let us know in our discord our social medias anything like that we'll be sure to uh give something back and donate to the cause we love showing uh love to those who show love to us you know with that being said we are officially out of life points guys thank you all for listening we'll be tuned in for another episode later on this week 
uh, for the another installment of the best TCG podcast that you guys have ever heard, the Semi Limited Podcast. With that being said, I am Player X. Thank you for listening, and good night.